Okay, hi everyone. Welcome to the depressing lecture in the Conservation Biology program. Previously we've talked about biodiversity, what biodiversity is, where it's found, how it's changed over time, how, um, how uh, it's preserved ecologically in an ecosystem. And now I want to get to the crux of the matter and the reason why we have the topic of uh, conservation biology, why we have the discipline of conservation biology, and that is extinction. And our extinction, uh, the definition of extinction is the loss of a species so that there is no more of that species left in the world. And it's a rather depressing thing. All the uh, special genetic variation, the genetic combinations which go into making that species are gone. All the phenotypic um, expressions, all the types of animals or plants which make up that um, species uh, will not be found again for if if ever. So extinction is something which is inherently bad and generally I think that most uh, people will feel that they don't want extinction of any species on the world in the world and they want to try and conserve those species and therefore conserve biodiversity. So in this lecture we're going to go through uh, extinction uh, we're going to take a look at, first of all, uh, what the situation is in the world, what sort of extinction is happening. Uh, we're going to take a look at where it is happening. We're going to take a look at the main drivers of extinction, why extinction is happening. And finally, we'll take a look at some of the species which are more vul vulnerable to extinction. So say for instance in the case of Trinidad, which species should we be moving to protect because they are the most vulnerable to extinction. And if we lose them in Trinidad, or the endemic species, if we lose the endemic, the species which are endemic to Trinidad, in other words they're found in Trinidad and nowhere else, then they're lost from the world. And all that unique genetic inheritance all those accumulated mutations and accumulated work of uh, natural selection over time will be lost. Okay, so extinctions and why does it have scientists so worried? Well, let's. I want to first introduce you to the concept of a mass extinction event. Okay, generally or in normal geological times, normal geological times, the extinction rates um, of species um, in the on the globe is usually about one to two species per year. So a background rate of extinction, it tends to be about one to two species lost per year. Um, Although we're not too sure exactly how many species are being lost, it's estimated, however, that currently with human influences, we're actually losing about, what was it, 3,000 species per year? A lot of species per year. Let's see where we've got. Right. We're losing about 50 to 80 species per day. Okay, so multiply that by 365 and contrast that with the background extinction rate of one to two species per year. So we are losing a lot more species uh, because of human activity than normally would be the case. Okay, now surprisingly this hasn't been the case, sorry, this is not the first time a modern-day mass extinction 
sorry, this is not the first time that a mass extinction event has occurred where extinction rates have massively outstripped speciation or evolution or new species creation rates. And it's occurred about five times previously uh, in the geological history. Um, of course, if we want to understand how this mass, this modern day mass extinction event uh, is uh, going to affect uh, the plants and animals on Earth and how uh, the reasons why it occurred in the past um, so that we can understand um, why it is happening in the future, uh, why it's happening now, uh, we have to take a look at history. Okay. So here is a graph showing the extinction rates through geological time. It's the Archean, the Paleozoic, the Mesozoic, and the um, recent, I guess, what the Quaternary and so on. Sorry, the Tertiary, the Cenozoic, I think it's called. Um, as you can see, the background extinction rate is fairly low. It's about uh, five, fa five families, five to six families per million years and it actually does seem to be decreasing over time but there are these blips in that background rate, that overall rate okay where there have been um, speculations and theories put forward to why these extinction events uh, were caused. Uh, the latest ones we probably have a better idea of why the extinctions cause. Um, the Cretaceous tertiary major extinction event um, is famous for uh, putting the uh, the final nail in the coffin of the dinosaurs it is thought because so the dinosaurs finally the large mega lizards disappeared after this uh, Cretaceous tertiary or KT extinction event as it's called. Now the this boundary this extinction event is marked at its start by a layer of iridium through sediments pretty much throughout the world and that is taken to mean that at this time some sort of asteroid hit the earth a massive asteroid hit the earth here's an artist's representation it's not a photograph there was nobody around at the time and um, huge amounts of dust and water and uh, material was uh, shoved up into the atmosphere large um, waves tsunamis were generated which swept around the world a few times and generally the smooth functioning of the atmosphere and the hydrosphere was radically disturbed probably for a few million years for at least a, a million years or so um, at the time rainforests were developing those of you who've done tropical uh, rainforests were pretty extensive over the globe after this uh, extraterrestrial impact um, forests were devastated for about a million or so years and it's only about a million and a half years after this impact um, that rainforests re-established to the former, their former uh, extent. Okay, so there was a million or so years of radically different global environment and many different species simply could not cope with that radical change. It's likely with the material in the atmosphere that there was um, like a mini ice age and the amount of solar energy getting through to the surface of the earth was severely cut so that uh, a lot of uh, individuals, a lot of populations of species were um, simply wiped out and some species which could survive that uh, those um, changes in environment were the only ones which survived. Having said that a lot of families did survive so the majority of the the families of rainforest plants for instance uh, 
did manage to survive. Uh, maybe down near the equator there was less change. We don't really know for sure. One major group which didn't survive, or they actually survived until after, but they were very severely um, crippled. Their populations were much reduced, so uh, they didn't really last very long afterwards. And those were the dinosaurs. And the mammals then radiated and increased in number uh, to fill all the vacant niches which the dinosaurs had left. And so the rise of the mammals occurred from this point and I guess we owe our existence here as humans to that extraterrestrial impact on the earth in the Cretaceous tertiary. These other extinction events have various um, reasons for their occurrence. Um, the late Ordovician uh, it's hypothesized that this extinction event was caused by life itself as um, plants uh, or photosynthetic organisms actually uh, increased in number in the oceans because there was no life on land by the late Ordovician. Um, a lot of oxygen was released into the atmosphere so what had previously been a very reducing environment with not much oxygen around suddenly became or increasingly became an oxygenated environment and switched to a more oxidizing environment. And some sort of threshold must have been reached in the late Ordovician where the, uh, the fundamental climate, fundamental environment switched from being a reducing environment to a oxygenating environment which led to the die-off of a lot of species. Uh, prior to this there was a lot of mutations which had all taken their place in the oceans and many of those um, many of those uh, phyla weird and wonderful as they were um, organisms like trilobites which you may have heard of were completely wiped out and we were left with the phyla that we see today the late Devonian extinction uh, is thought to be the result of uh, massive primary productivity again changing the um, atmosphere and in this case stripping out CO2 from the atmosphere and therefore reducing the greenhouse effect of the atmosphere and thus tipping the world into a glacial an ice age basically so glaciers massively expanded and covered the surface of the earth well not the whole surface of the earth but um, large portions of the earth and the remainder of the earth suffered from much lower temperatures and reduced rainfall and that led to devastation of the ecosystems. So the late Devonian extinction event is thought to be uh, have ca been caused by um, green plants being too successful. Late Ordovician also likewise photosynthetic organisms in oceans being too successful. This was terrestrial plants, this is ocean-based plants. I'm not too sure about the Permian Triassic and the Late Triassic extinction events. But anyway, you get the idea. Different extinction, mass extinction events caused by different uh, factors uh, down through geological history. And all the evidence points to the start of another modern day mass extinction event. So I got some pictures of uh, some organisms which have gone extinct like the dodo and the thylacine or Tasmanian tiger and a couple of species which are on the brink of extinction like the giant panda and the, um, the tiger which is very much reduced throughout its range. Although I did see here, read a positive news article that populations of tigers in India actually have increased by about a third over the past uh, five to ten years. So maybe there's some hope for the tiger in the wild um, yet. But other these these guys are really the dodo and the thylacine. They they are really uh, what's the term poster examples, mega examples of the type of extinction event we're going through but it's really 
all the small insignificant organisms uh, like the plants and you know the vascular plants the small vascular plants even the trees and um, the microbes and the bacteria which are being lost day in day out that is really contributing to this mass extinction event so where is this mass extinction event happening now well in the past uh, it has taken place in temperate ecosystems however those temperate ecosystems as we've seen tend to hold much less species than the tropical ecosystems and by and large large amounts of temperate species are still extant although some uh, were lost in other examples in prehistory uh, we look at say for instance Hawaii in the Polynesian Islands when um, the Polynesians reached these islands uh, a wave of extinction did take place uh, many of the larger uh, more, more preferred game animals were driven to extinction or very much uh, reduced in size for instance the uh, the mowers on New Zealand and the elephant birds in Madagascar and a number of small songbirds in Hawaii for instance I um, mean it's thought that even in terrest um, continental ecosystems humans drove uh, some of the larger representatives of the ecosystem to extinction and therefore quite often uh, caused a certain amount of change in that ecosystem and also bringing fire to the ecosystem changed the ecosystem for many animals which weren't actually directly hunted. But currently if we as conservation biologists uh, want to slow down the mass extinction event or stop it happening or moderate it we need to know where extinctions are happening now so we know what we uh, need to do so where is the modern day mass extinction event happening uh, well we have to really go to where most of the species are and as we've seen in previous lectures most of the species are in rainforests and on coral reefs. So there's an estimated 10 million species on Earth, that's a conservative estimate, 10 to 50 million. 90% um, of those 10 million species on Earth are terrestrial, so 90% of species are terrestrial. 80% of the terrestrial species are tropical, and of those 80% of terrestrial species, tropical terrestrial species, 50% are tropical forest species so the vast ma the majority of species on earth are in tropical forests now up until now tropical forests have been relatively intact they have been spared um, this is compared to say temperate ecosystems um, for instance some temperate ecosystems like the uh, temperate grasslands and the temperate broadleaf forests are almost 60 to 80 percent of the extent of those ecosystems have been lost and in some places uh, the loss rate is over 90 percent so uh, terrestrial ecosystems have been hammered in the past but at the moment uh, the tropical ecosystems are the ones which are being uh, hammered. So tropical forests are the major focal, foci for global biodiversity and tropical forests are the biome where habitat depletion is occurring fastest. It's already occurred in these temperate broadleaf forests and now uh, humans are turning their attention to uh, tropical forests and as you can see in the pictures there is a conversion of tropical forests to um, pasture land and so on so just a complete denudation where the number of the vast number of species which can live in an intact tropical forest are basically driven out or destroyed uh, to make way for a smaller subset uh, 
of species which humans use in their uh, economic endeavors. Coral reefs are also a main focus of biodiversity in the world, uh, not in terms of numbers of species, but more in terms of higher level taxa. As we saw, there are about 34 phyla in marine ecosystems, um, and there are about 11 to 12. I think there's 12 in terrestrial ecosystems. So there's fewer phyla, much fewer phyla in terrestrial ecosystems. Much more species, but much fewer phyla in um, terrestrial ecosystems. So when we lose um, uh, when we lose taxa in marine ecosystems, if we lose a phyla, that really represents a huge amount of genetic variation, a huge amount of unique, distinct genetic variation, which life on Earth may need in the future to cope with some sort of massive environmental change. For instance, like um, an asteroid impact or something like that. So, Coral reef ecosystems are the most diverse marine ecosystem. They contain 33% of the marine fish species in 0.2% um, of the area. 93% of them are damaged in some way. I was quite staggered by this, um, this fact, this figure. 93%. So practically all coral reefs all around the world are impacted by humans and human activities. I guess that makes sense because coral reefs are coastal ecosystems and humans really do prefer coastal environments to live because um, they can get um, sustenance from the ocean and also from the terrestrial environment in, in that way they hedge their bets when it comes to sustenance. So humans tend to focus on, and in the past they've always focused on coastal uh, regions to settle and particularly in the tropics coral reefs are very much coastal uh, ecosystems. Humans also, uh, what they do on land as well as what they do in the ocean impacts on coral reefs. So the runoff from rivers and streams from the land into the ocean has a big impact on coral reefs and is quite often the reason why coral reefs are destroyed. So up in Buku Reef uh, there's a fair amount or in the coral reefs of Tobago because there's not that many coral reefs around Trinidad simply because we live in the delta of the Orinoco so there's simply too much sediment in the water um, around Trinidad to really support coral reefs and it's only when you get up into Tobago which is in the direct flow of the um, the ocean currents coming from the east so a lot of that sediment is uh, driven away that you start to get good coral reef development but around Tobago a lot of that coral reef is degraded and in trouble and under stress because of runoff from the land, from human activity. So when humans clear the land, um, it promotes the erosion of sediments into the river, which it's transported out into the ocean, and that reduces the amount of light reaching, reaching the coral, and also allows sediment to settle on top of the coral, blocking the light again, and that can really cause the death of coral over large areas. Uh, this sort of um, process is occurring not only around Tobago but around most coral reefs around the world. It's estimated that about a third to a half of the Great Barrier Reef in Australia has been damaged or destroyed so that, you know, it, by human activities on land uh, in contribution um, but also in combination with uh, global climate change. Um, and increase in CO2 in the waters, making them more acidic and making it more difficult for coral to lay down the cal calcium carbonate, which they use for um, skeletons and so on. Five to 10% of coral reefs are destroyed. Some of the direct and most visible practices which lead to destruction of coral reefs are things like dynamite fishing, 
which take place in some um, countries uh, like the Philippines and so on. Um, and what this involves is uh, heaving a stick of dynamite over, a small stick of dynamite over the side of the boat and letting it explode, bang, and that stuns and kills all the fish for quite a large area around and so the fisherman just moves around picking up all these dead fish. It's a very uh, effective way of fishing but as you can imagine lobbing dynamite onto a coral reef and letting it explode, explode basically destroys the reef. So you don't need to do that too, too often uh, before coral reefs are destroyed. So let's talk about now some of the reasons why this mass extinction event is happening. Um, these different, uh, these different uh, ways in which extinctions are occurring, the reasons for the extinction, extinctions occurring um, have been given a name because they fall into four main categories and that's the evil quintet. It used to be the evil trinity, but now it's the evil quintet because uh, I think pollution has been added to that as well as human activity increases around the world and just generally screws everything up. But the main reason why extinction is happening is the main impact on tropical forests, and that is destruction of those tropical uh, forests and therefore destruction of habitat because with the destruction of tropical forests you not only kill the uh, trees directly but you kill the habitat or the species which use those trees as habitat to survive so you lose the trees and you lose all the animals which depend on those trees so it's the single most important threat to biodiversity in the world today. So the remaining tropical forests that we have on Earth, and 50% of them have already been lost, occupy about 6% of the land surface of the Earth, and they are being lost at a rate of approximately 2% of that remaining 50% per year. That's about 150,000 kilometers squared per year. And a similar rate is being degraded all the time. So the reason why they're being lost and degraded, uh, logging activities uh, is probably one of the fir first human land use activities and one of the, um, but a uh, forest ecosystem can usually recover from that. The reason why this degradation of tropical forests sometimes becomes um, permanent is because logging quite often opens up the forest to agricultural settlement. So logging needs roads to cart out all the timber. So, and these roads allow people to penetrate into the rainforest easily where they couldn't do before. So this opens up the um, rainforest ecosystem to destruction. The rate is said to be accelerating, but um, in other parts of the tropics, particularly in Southeast Asia, uh, there is another reason why um, uh, large areas of rainforest is being lost. And this is a reason here. You can see this, there's a regular pattern in this forest. And that pattern is rows and rows of oil plums. So thousands and thousands of hectares of tropical forest in Borneo um, in Indonesian and Malaysian Borneo are being converted, mainly Indonesian Borneo, are being converted to oil palm plantations, particularly after the oil shock of the late 2000s when uh, fuel suddenly shot up in price. Um, oil palms were a convenient source of biofuel, so the price for um, oil palm really went through the roof and allowed or made establishment of more oil palm plantations much more economic. So large areas of forest are being converted for agriculture 
Uh, this is not a new trend. In the past, it also happened in Trinidad, for instance. The majority of the forest, or a large area of the forest, maybe about 40% or so, to 50% of the forest in Trinidad, was cleared and replanted with cocoa plantation. So large areas of Trinidad were uh, converted, large areas of forest was lost in Trinidad and converted to cocoa plantation. Large areas of those cocoa plantations are now being abandoned as cocoa is not lived up to it well has suffered and the cost of cocoa production is simply too high to make it economic. So clearing for agriculture is another reason for habitat destruction alter, um, and alteration. The rate is accelerating. The relationship between habitat loss and species loss is, is quite complex. It's not a real one-to-one -one thing. Um, quite often, um, if you lose 50% of a habitat, you don't lose 50% of a species because you will tend to uh, work with the species area relationship for the different taxa. Some taxa will be driven to extinction more than others, and we'll talk more about that in vulnerability of species to extinction. Um, and some species will be able to survive in a much smaller area of habitat. On the whole, it works out to about 90%. If 90% of an ecosystem is lost in an area, then around 50% of the species in that ecosystem will be lost. 50% will survive, but 50% will be lost. So, all things being equal, if you have 10% of the habitat left, then you should have about 50% of the species left. Okay, And that 10%, strangely enough, it's actually around 10 to 15%, is the uh, generally accepted uh, amount of ecosystem, of each ecosystem, which um, is recommended be placed in some sort of protected area um, preservation system for each country um, by the IUCN, which is the International Union for Conservation of Nature. Um, and they do a lot of scientific work on conservation biology and trying to stop this massive extinction event. Um, so in Trinidad, we should try and find out what ecosystems we have and work out a protected area network which protects a, at least 15% of each of those ecosystems. Some ecosystems will be able to preserve more, some we will we simply don't have 15% left and we need to um, preserve all of them. Uh, another point which needs to be made is that last 10% is quite often very fragmented. So this theoretical um, support of 50% of the species within 10% of the remaining ecosystem is quite often misleading and optimistic with fragmentation effects 50% um, of the species may not be supported in that last 10% so maybe we need to conserve more than that uh, example of that um, is the Atherton Tablelands this is in the northeast of Australia in their wet tropical environment where there's rainforest. Um, all of this area would be rainforest which if you look at it it looks pretty much the same as um, pretty much the same as uh, the rainforest here in Trinidad. I spent about a, a year or so there and uh, working in, in the rainforest there. This is what the environment looks like. It's pretty hilly in places but as you can see that there's fragments of rainforest all through there. In this area, particularly the central area, there's a, a drier type of rainforest which is known as the Marby rainforest. 90% of that has been lost and there's only a few patches left. There's a patch there, a patch there, and a few patches around. 
in the landscape. Only 10% of it left and a few edges around this big patch of rainforest here. So it's all very fragmented. So this is a case where 90% of the Marby rainforest has been uh, cleared and only 10% is left and that remaining 10% is very fragmented. Some of the charismatic species which used to occur in this Marby uh, rainforest are tree kangaroos and I should have a picture of those because they look so cute so you'd be going oh no why would we weren't don't want to lose the tree kangaroo um, it is it does occur in other habitats but the Marby rainforest was its center that they, they had the highest populations in the Marby rainforest pretty much all gone now though there is restoration attempts being still being made to try and preserve those um, remaining 10% and try to link them up so they don't become isolated and just gradually lose all their species. Uh, yeah, degradation of habitat in a fragmented landscape also um, causes the reduction of the utility of these fragments for conservation. So, for instance, this fragment may get fires on the edges and, and so on and drying out of the edges so it's only the center of that fragment which is effectively still untouched <coughs> excuse me some species as I said before <coughs> are affected more than others species as we will take a look later on in the lecture species which are need have big home ranges <coughs> need large areas of habitat and may be really affected but others like some butterflies may uh, only need a small area of habitat actually this butterfly is meant to represent species which require closed canopy no disturbance so they they cannot go too close to the edges of the rainforest this is a uh, Ulysses butterfly which is very similar to the morpho butterfly that we have in Trinidad this guy cannot survive around the edges and it needs the interior so that means that they can only survive in a very restricted area in these fragments and they're much more likely to go extinct similarly the tree kangaroos are also more likely to go extinct through the, the remaining fragmented landscape they quite often can become very uh, very much prey to large birds of prey because they have a habit of sitting out on exposed branches and eating new leaves okay because they are herbivores and big birds of prey can fly down and go chomp and fly away with them so degradation may put in place trained processes that will go on causing loss of species into the future so this fragmentation and isolation of populations of um, small populations of species may hang on um, particularly long-live um, species like trees and so on but in some cases those trees the uh, environment for regeneration of those trees has been lost uh, for instance you know you may have isolated paddock trees and you say yeah we've still got those trees in the area but they're not regenerating because they can't because cattle come along and graze all their seedlings or they cannot set seed because there's no um, no other species they can breed with in uh, the proximity so it means that approximately 20,000 to 30,000 species are being lost every year in tropical forests it is estimated from looking at the area of tropical forest being lost that's about 50 to 80 species a day and that's much higher than the background extinction rate of one to two species per year so that is the reason why it is thought that we are in the middle of another mass extinction event this um, rate of extinction is probably underestimated because a species must be unrecorded for 50 years before it is declared extinct and um, 50 years is a long time to wait when you know that all the habitat for that species is gone so it's likely that species is gone as well <coughs>
So declaring a species extinct is a very elaborate process, much like describing a species, and unfortunately it really does distort the perception of the extinction rates around the world. With all of this, it is um, conservatively estimated that approximately 50% of plant and animal species will be extinct within 100 years unless the rate of habitat destruction, fragmentation and alteration is not changed. So think about that. 50% of the plant and animal species which currently exist on the world today, even in its depleted form, will be extinct within 100 years if we don't do something about habitat destruction. But habitat destruction is not the only way in which uh, species are being driven to extinction. Other reasons for uh, species being lost are uh, introduced species, uh, over harvesting, and also pollution, and they form the evil quartet. Interest, introduced species are basically species which have been moved around the surface of the earth by humans, introduced in an area where they are not native to the ecosystem, and therefore those species will tend to um, drive out the native species. So yeah, introduced species is another way in which um, species around the world are being driven to extinction. These introduced species put pressure on the native flora and fauna through competition and drive them out. Uh, they are particularly bad in areas where they can really dis disrupt and completely change the ecosystem. So I've got a couple of examples here. Uh, this is Lantana. Um, it's a fairly common shrub here in Trinidad where I think it's native to Trinidad and if not native to Trinidad then to South America. But in Australia, uh, because for some reason it doesn't have any checks on its um, growth, it can form these huge vine thickets which climb up and scramble over everything and basically suppress the succession. So in rainforest areas in Australia, lantana is a huge problem because it prevents regeneration of the rainforest because nothing can grow underneath it in Australia. Um, other examples of introduced species um, would be say some tropical grasses like elephant grass say here in Trinidad. Now elephant grass is, is fine, it grows up nice and but it dries out during the dry season very quickly and it is very prone to fire. So it can survive a fire because it, when in the dry season it will, um, it will dry back to uh, a rootstock and it can re-sprout from that rootstock. So if a fire goes through then it's not killed and it just springs up again. And that can cause uh, what is can disrupt the ecosystem by promoting fire, promoting a regular fire and therefore um, creating a situation where there's no longer a, a rainforest in that area. So introduced species can be a real problem. Other ways in which introduced species can be a problem uh, through, com uh, through competition. So here is um, Myconia. Now Myconia is uh, also a species which occurs naturally in, in Trinidad and it isn't a problem. But when it gets into Asian um, rainforests in Southeast Asia, it becomes a real pest because there's nothing there to um, subdue it and um, knock it back. So it just grows up big huge plants, much bigger than it um, grows in uh, Trinidad where it has things which eat it and other plants which compete with it, it just goes crazy in uh, Southeast Asia and takes over the, the gap and takes over all the uh, regeneration spots and basically retard succession. Other ways in which introduced species can uh, destabilize an ecosystem and drive species to extinction is through predation.
you've all seen this uh, image before or this uh, species before this is a lionfish now the lionfish is native to the Pacific and the Indian Oceans it doesn't it's not native to the Atlantic and the Caribbean but um, it has been introduced now it's probably introduced as a uh, escapee from the aquarium trade up in Florida and it's been spreading southwards from the Florida area ever since and it's recently been uh, found in uh, Tobago and in Trinidad off Trinidad now these guys are coral reef species they invade the coral reef and they're voracious predators so these introduced species can disrupt the ecosystem through predation they can basically eat out certain species and particularly the young of certain species and really um, influence the ecosystem structure um, island ecosystems are particularly vulnerable to uh, continental areas. Now the reason for this is um, continental populations of species tend to be quite large so mutations and evolution advance quicker in these areas and so advances in productivity and um, just ways of doing things are much more advanced in continental areas and are less advanced in island areas. So when a continental species is introduced to the island, it can usually outcompete or outpredate um, all the other uh, island species and so tends to wipe them out through competition. So introduced species can be a very big problem. Um, they are particularly a problem where ecosystems are uh, first disturbed by humans so a rainforest which is intact and has a closed canopy is quite often uh, resistant to invasion by introduced or exotic species so that um, uh, the introduced species cannot get a hold but if they are disturbed that releases resources and nutrients and so on for the introduced species which are quite often better competitors for those resources and they are able to monopolize those resources um, because rainforests form the main habitat in Trinidad uh, Trinidad tends not to have such a problem with introduced species compared to when you go further up the islands to say um, uh, Bahamas and so on which tend not to have rainforest habitats and so there are resources which are available for a more competitive species and they can come through and disrupt the ecosystem. One area where introduced species are looking, uh, are looking like they're going to have a big impact is in the Aripo savannas and in particular on the boundaries between the marsh forest and the open savanna and the introduced species which may have an impact is um, the acacia mangemum which has been introduced into this country uh, for restoring uh, degraded uh, ex-quarry soils okay so uh, acacia mangemum fixes nitrogen quite well and therefore is able to grow in very low nutrient soils um, those sorts of soils exist in the Aripo savannas in natural ecosystems and so the acacia is able to invade they don't invade uh, the forest itself the marsh forest they can't invade that because there's not enough light they can't invade the open savanna because it's too dry during the dry season and they would die they would desiccate and die but they can survive in the margins or the boundaries between the marsh forest and the open savanna okay and there are several species which also specialize in those margin habitats and one of the main ones is the Maurice palm which is a keystone species for many other species within um, the Aripo savannas including the red-bellied macaw and the Maurice oriole which are two very rare or quite rare species to Trinidad and it wouldn't take and that margin habitat is about the only habitat they have in Trinidad 
So if the acacia gets established in the Arepa savannas and starts to force out the Maurice palm, then we're probably going to lose uh, not just the Maurice palm, but also these other birds as well. So introduced species, not good news. So we need to watch out for those. One of the reasons why um, extinctions have occurred around the world and in particular on island ecosystems. The next reason why um, species are going extinct around the world uh, is exploitation and over harvesting and that's basically human use and misuse of natural resources. In the pre-colonial past, um, that's say before the 1500s, um, there has been many examples of humans um, hunting animals to extinction. Um, I've got an example there of the Polynesians in uh, New Zealand. Uh, so the Maori uh, were the Poly uh, Polynesians which um, invaded or colonized New Zealand. And when they did, they found these large um, birds, which are called moas. Uh, moa in Polynesian is actually chicken. So these were some pretty stunning chickens. Uh, this picture uh, represents a scenario uh, which has been put together to, to show how Maori would hunt the moa. And this moa is actually a reconstruction. It's a basically a stuffed bird. Um, there were no moa left by the time Europeans arrived with their cameras uh, in New Zealand. They had been completely hunted out by the Maori. Other examples are the giant ground sloths which disappeared uh, from uh, islands like Cuba and um, Hispaniola um, soon after humans arrived in the Greater Antilles. Uh, Northern South America was also a scene for the demise of these giant ground sloths. So these beasts are about the size of a cow and they move as quickly as sloths. They just move around the ground and they um, browse on uh, leaves and vegetation. Um, very vulnerable to overhunting and so uh, they were hunted out by um, the first humans to arrive in this area and patterns like this have been repeated all around the world from North America to Asia and many of the islands Australia as well one place where it hasn't happened so much is in Africa um, there is still a suite of megafauna there in other words large mammals which uh, still survive um, People think that it's because humans evolved in Africa, so they grew up with, um, or more importantly, the populations of the megafauna evolved with the humans. So they had the ability to resist overhunting by the humans in Africa. So there are also other um, factors which kept human population density within control. It's like pests and diseases which kept human populations down and so prevented humans getting too numerous to go in and wipe out the megafauna and so on. Okay, These days exploitation and over harvesting is still a big problem around the world. Um, some example, uh, the, the main examples these days are in fisheries. Uh, this is bluefin tuna Bluefin tuna numbers are at about 10% of their pre-harvest levels before humans started harvesting. They're being basically fished to extinction. And the many countries have basically closed the fisheries for bluefin tuna and to try and hope and help the populations of these fish recover. In other parts of the world, in the North Atlantic, the cod fisheries off um, the northeast of the United States and Canada were basically fished to economic extinction. There are still cod there but they're in such low numbers that it just doesn't make it economic to go fishing for them. And this is the result of over harvesting. Um, if humans were to put more effort in they could drive the cod 
to extinction and it's touch and go whether that will actually happen. The passenger pigeon is a classic case of over harvesting in North America in the United States. The passenger pigeon used to be so numerous that it used to black out the sky when flocks flew overhead. Um, the passenger pigeon is extinct now because um, the, the colonists of uh, North America organized hunts where they would just go out and shoot thousands and thousands of these birds from these flocks um, and you know take the carcasses back and eat some of them and throw the rest away and they basically hunted this um, species to extinction. What effect that has had on the ecosystems is probably masked by most of those ecosystems being converted to farmlands in North America but if if they weren't, they probably would have had a big impact. A couple of um, Trinidad examples of over harvesting <clears throat> is the, the Broadway's orchid on the Aripo savannas. Now this species is rare. It only occurs on the Aripo savannas in Trinidad. It also occurs in mainland South America, so it's not endemic to Trinidad, but it is fairly rare wherever it occurs. The populations in the Aripo savannas have been declining. Um, nobody really knows exactly why, but it's likely that it is declining because of over-collecting as well as other uh, natural effects. Uh, people love orchids in Trinidad and they will collect them from the wild. Uh, occasionally people will go to the Aripo savannas and find as many of these easily gathered orchids that they can find because they just grow on the ground so they're they're quite easy to find um, to dig up I wouldn't say that they're extremely easy to find but the ones which are easy to find have probably been uh, gathered and and sold for a few dollars in in markets and so on also in Trinidad are the cage birds basically the bullfinch and the semp well, the bullfinch is basically extinct in Trinidad now um, and any bullfinches that you see are usually brought in from mainland South America, Guyana and Venezuela where they can fetch up to 10,000 uh, TT dollars or so. Every so often a bullfinch uh, makes it across from um, South America and um, it's found on the tops of the northern range where they usually occur and feed off the sedges and grasses which grow in gaps up there. Um, people will go and trap them uh, because they sell for a, quite a lot of money um, to cage bird fanciers. So that's at a case where uh, particular species of birds like bullfinch but also other species such as semp um, and other singing birds. Okay. In Trinidad they have really depressed the populations and the populations are heading to extinction. There are regulations which prevent catching of these birds uh, from the wild and they should be captive bred or um, imported from other areas. Okay, So exploitation and over harvesting, another part of the evil uh, quintet in addition, waste from extraction of non-biological resources can cause extinction. So uh, quarrying is another cause of um, extinctions. Um, in Trinidad, it's easy enough to see the areas around Valencia which have um, been cleared of their natural ecosystems for gravel uh, quarrying. And on a much larger scale in Guyana, Suriname and Brazil, uh, areas of the rainforest there are uh, cleared and and uh, quarried for gold mining. Um, gold mining disturbs the forest in relatively small areas but those areas are very intensely disturbed and the rainforest will take many hundreds of years to recolonize those areas once they're abandoned. Also these uh, gold mines will also introduce mercury into the aquatic ecosystems often which can poison um, other species indirectly. 
Another way in which over-harvesting or harvesting of um, natural ecosystems can uh, impact on biodiversity is through what is known as collateral damage. So species which are not directly targeted for harvesting are caught or killed by the harvesting process. And a couple of the examples which are very serious at the moment are um, catching of albatrosses uh, in long line uh, fisheries. Now long line fisheries are used um, um, in several fisheries to catch uh, pelagic um, predatory fish like uh, toothfish and swordfish. So what that means is they would um, play out a line of fishing, uh, a fishing line uh, with hooks at say uh, two or three meter intervals baited with um, fish, um, dead fish along the line and they would tow those lines which are, can be two or three kilometers long um, with their hooks along them with those fish um, through the ocean and um, they would reel them in periodically and take off all the toothfish and other pelagic fish maybe tuna as well um, and it's a very effective means of fishing unfortunately albatross have learned to follow these fishing boats and they will dive down and try and take the fish from the lines. Sometimes they'll be successful, but more often they get hooked by the hooks. And once they get hooked, obviously they're pulled under and drowned and that's the end of the albatross. And this has been estimated to be causing a massive mortality in the albatross populations around the world. Uh, turtles are also um, often uh, caught in nets um, by fishing boats. Um, seine netting and um, dredge netting can uh, scoop up um, turtles and also dolphins and once they get caught in the net because they're air breathing animals they cannot breathe anymore and they will drown. Um, this collateral damage has had big impacts on these different populations of fairly rare um, and certainly not very numerous um, species around the world so it's a big problem in certain areas we may lose the albatross because of this um, turtle populations are certainly very impacted um, and they've recently uh, tried to make uh, fishermen use nets which have small openings or have openings in them which allow turtles and dolphins to escape all right the next member of the evil quintet is pollution and toxification. Well, that's the final member of the quintet. This has recently been added to the Hall of Infamy uh, because it's realized that the amount of pollution from growing human society is now really beginning to impact all around the world. Uh, even in areas where there are no humans for hundreds of kilometers, uh, for instance, in the middle of the oceans of the world. There can be huge collections of drift um, pollution of floating material, of bottles and old rope. And as you can see down there, flip-flops and so on, floating around the world. Light bulbs also float up very well and, and um, form part of this uh, pollution around the world. They say there's no ocean in the world now where you can go where you will see or you won't see some pollution around even the middle of the Pacific. But it's not just the floating debris which is a problem but also chemicals um, uh, which are released into aquatic and oceanic ecosystems which are having a big impact on uh, especially marine and aquatic ecosystems but also terrestrial ecosystems as well. And this problem is only getting bigger and bigger as uh, the human population uh, develops and becomes more and more um, industrially uh, and economically advanced, particularly countries like China and India. And they develop their standard of living and demand more resources and create more waste.
so aquatic ecosystems and species in aquatic ecosystems are particularly uh, vulnerable. The Great Barrier Reef, I've already talked about the pollution from runoff, but it's not only sediment, but it's also fertilizer, which is put on the sugarcane crops in the area, which is a big problem, because that fertilizer, once it enters the ocean, uh, forms blooms of algae in the water column, which can further reduce the light, which basically can kill off the coral reefs. Here in Trinidad, pig farms are a big source of pollution uh, for aquatic ecosystems. Everybody likes their pork, um, but pig farms can reduce, uh, can pr uh, produce a lot of heavy metals, <coughs> which uh, find their way into the aquatic ecosystems and accumulate <coughs> and gradually cause those ecosystems to be poisoned and sterilize them. <coughs> the nitrates from pig farms are also a big uh, problem in other ecosystems, say in Europe. <coughs> in Holland, uh, nitrates from pig farming in the groundwater uh, forms really bad eutroph eutrophication uh, pollution and blooms of algae. And in my home city of Perth in Australia, also the fertilizer and the, um, the uh, feces pollution from animal farming uh, causes blooms of algae in the estuary there, which causes death of fish and also um, problems with people as well if they dare to go swimming in the ocean, in the estuary there. DDT is a classic example of pollution um, in North America and that was the reason why DDT, uh, which is a pesticide, is banned around the world today. Uh, DDT in North America was uh, finally identified as the reason why um, the bald eagle, which is a top, top of the line predator in North America, was basically dying out. Now the bald eagle has a very important cultural significance for North Americans and uh, the fact that their, um, their emblem was dying out in their, in their country was a, a cause of great alarm to them. So they basically did the research and found that DDT was causing the eggs of these predators to become too thin to be able to be incubated. So the mother birds would sit on the eggs and they would basically crack and, the, and die. So DDT has been phased out and the bald eagles are making a recovery. Okay, and the DDT is not the only pesticide which uh, has had a bad effect um, in uh, India at the moment, in Central Asia at the moment. Uh, the populations of vultures which prey upon cow carcasses is basically been slowly uh, wiped out because they feed on carcasses of dead cows and quite often those cows have been treated with um, chemicals to prevent parasites and keep them healthy and that just basically kills off the vultures. So vultures in uh, South Asia are in great danger now because of pollution. All right, so that's the evil quintet, over harvesting, um, over, sorry, over harvesting, habitat loss and destruction, uh, pollution, and introduced species. Now, quite often these um, effects don't act individually. Quite often they may act in combination. Uh, so, for instance, introduced species will be uh, at their worst when humans already disturb the ecosystem and degrade the ecosystem and release nutrients and resources into the ecosystem which introduced species can take advantage of. Okay? Another way in which um, these threats can act in uh, combination is uh, that one problem may be hidden by another problem. Okay, um, In Australia there's a big problem with introduced 
predators like foxes and cats. Um, recently, a, a method was developed of poison baits, which basically wiped out the fox populations. And um, this was all seen as a good thing because it meant that the small and medium-sized mammals like the wallabies and the um, bandicoots and so on and the numbats and the wombats would be able to regenerate because the predation pressure from the fox which was driving them to extinction had been released. Unfortunately what happened was that the foxes were also keeping populations of um, introduced cats uh, in check as well and once the foxes were removed the cat populations boomed and cats were even more efficient predators than the foxes so the um, populations of these native marsupials uh, rebounded for a couple of years and then suddenly they crashed again and scientists were scratching their heads to try and find out why and the reason was there were two introduced species there which were forming a double whammy on these um, on these uh, marsupial populations and now the race is on to try and find some method to control the cat populations because they don't take baits as readily as the fox population so baiting uh, will need to be very much more refined and and um, and uh, targeted if they're going to take care of the cat population as well so but um, it, one thing that um, that whole episode did show was that introduced predators were the main reason for the loss of many of the small and medium sized um, marsupials on uh, in Australian ecosystems across Australia. Global warming is a big uh, problem which is probably going to put extra stress on many different ecosystems and if working in combination with those uh, the evil quintet is probably going to massively increase the rates of um, extinction around the world. Uh, global climate change is going to act in a couple of different ways. First of all, it will shift uh, the biophysical zones or the life zones which species need to survive. Um, some life zones will shift in altitude, they will go up mountains and so on. And that will mean that um, the species which in order to survive will need to shift with them but if the habitat has been fragmented then those species may not be able to shift uh, across the farmland or the agricultural land or the roads which are blocking their way and so their populations will not be able to migrate and they will go extinct so in that way global climate change is going to uh, massively increase the impact of fragmentation on biodiversity loss. Another way in which global climate change, but this time in, the, in terms of the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere will cause or increase extinction, is CO2 dissolved in the waters of the oceans of the world will make it more acidic and put more stress, stress on coral reefs. These coral reefs are already under threat or under stress from pollution from land-based sources, um, dynamite fishing and other overfishing. And so this global climate change will be another pressure put on top and may push uh, many of the species of coral reefs finally over the edge. Okay, so syner synergistic or multiple impacts on ecosystems from one or more of the evil um, quintet and other impacts like global climate change are likely to have a big uh, accelerating impact on the extinction rate around the world. Okay, now I'm, I'm done talking with um, the broad general reasons for um, uh, extinction around the world today. What I want to go on to now just briefly is looking at patterns of species vulnerability. Some species are more likely to go to extinct than others. 
some species have attributes which make them more predispos predisposed to extinction. Some species, on the other hand, uh, have features which make them more resistant to uh, extinction. So I want to go through just briefly some of the ways in which uh, species are more prone or less prone to extinction. Okay, the first um, characteristic which predisposes a species to extinction is rarity. So if a species is rare, then it's more likely that its population can be wiped out um, and it will go extinct. And that rarity doesn't necessarily have to be rarity in um, rarity across the whole um, and, um, across a long time span. A species only has to be rare at particular times for it to be more vulnerable to extinction. And the example that I've got here is uh, one that's often quoted is the snowshoe hare and the lynx. They go through oscillations in their population sizes. Now the oscillations are reflected here in the number of uh, pelts of the snowshoe hare and the lynx which are caught by trappers and that's a reflection of the number of individuals in the population from about 1845 up to uh, the 1930s. So you can see the, pop, the number of pelts of snowshoe hares varies as you go through the years. Some years there's a huge um, take and that's usually when there's lots of snowshoe hares around. Other years there's very little pelts taken and that again is a reflection of the um, number of snowshoe hares around. Okay, So the population of snowshoe hares oscillates and fluctuates widely and this is because the snowshoe hare is effectively a um, R-selected species which has um, no population density um, dependent mortality. So in other words they will just breed up while the resources are available until they exhaust the resources and then the population will crash. Okay, Once the population crashes the um, amount of resources begin to build up again Okay, because there's no um, snowshoe hares around to eat it until there's a point where there's enough resources for the population to boom once again. And it booms, reaches uh, unsustainably high density, the resource is removed again and the population crashes once again. Okay? So this species, although on average it has a fairly high population level, it's at the periods at the bottom of the crash where they're most vulnerable. So the population may go from several thousand down to 10 individuals, for instance, just uh, for the sake of uh, argument. 10 individuals is much more easy or much more vulnerable to being wiped out by some disease event or some um, extremely cold winter, which means that there's no food around and those 10 individuals will die. Okay, So a smaller population is very much more vulnerable to a external or some sort of stochastic effect which will wipe out those small numbers of individuals. A larger population is much more secure. Okay, But if this snowshoe hare um, encounters a stochastic event when its population levels are low, like a disease event, then it won't be able to regenerate again because all the individuals will be dead. It will be extinct. Okay, So rarity or small population size predisposes a species to extinction. Okay, The lynx which preys upon the 
snowshoe hare, which is population will boom as the number of snowshoe hares increases and crash when the number of snowshoe hare uh, populations crash is also uh, a species whose population um, levels fluctuate widely and it is in danger of going extinct when its numbers are very low. Okay, So rarity predisposes a species to extinction and makes them more vulnerable to the different extinction processes. Here in Trinidad, I've got a couple of Trinidad examples here. We have the Powie and we have that same Broadway's orchid which grows on the Arepo savannas. Now these two species are rare but they're rare in different ways. The Broadway's orchid is restricted to the Arepo savannas which is only a few um, square kilometers of Trinidad, not very much area, okay? And so the populations are restricted to a very small area of Trinidad, okay? And within those that small area, there may be, you know, you know maybe a couple of hundred individuals, okay? So on a national scale, on a regional scale, these are quite rare. But once you get within the Arepo savannas, you can usually find these quite easily. So within the savannas, they're quite common, but, out, but on a national scale, they are very uncommon because they're restricted to a very small area. So that's one type of rarity. Okay? That type of rarity makes it vulnerable to extinction um, because all of the individuals are in one spot. So they're vulnerable to being burnt, for instance. One burning event can wipe out half of the known population in Trinidad. Okay? And it wouldn't take many, many of those sorts of fires to wipe out the whole population. And voila, they are extinct in Trinidad. So being rare in terms of um, being restricted to very small areas makes a species both plant and animal, more vulnerable to extinction because all their eggs are in one basket. And if that basket is overturned, burnt, upset, or catches a disease, then all the individuals are gone and the species is extinct. The Powie, on the other hand, has another type of rarity. The Powie uh, ranges over many hundreds of square kilometers up in northwest sorry northeast Trinidad up around the Matura area Grand Riviere Matura and they range uh, as far west as I understand up to Cerro del Aripo and so on generally the uh, montane and higher montane areas of the northern range where they eat fruits and and um, so on of the trees and the plants in those areas but they range over a very wide area. So at any one time, that area may be damaged by fire or hurricane or something like that. They will be able to move to another part of the area. So they don't suffer from the same type of rarity as the uh, Arepo orchid, the Broadway's orchid, but nowhere in that area are they very common. So you can go to that area um, for 10 years and not see a Powie because they are so rare. Okay, So they may range over a wide distance, but their density is very low. And that's a different kind of rarity. Okay, Now, that still makes a population of this animal uh, vulnerable to extinction. Um, it makes it vulnerable, more vulnerable to extinction uh, through habitat loss. Because they range over a wide area, that usually means they need a wide area to survive. And habitat loss um, and you know, destruction of native habitat is going to affect a species which requires a larger area more than a species re which requires a smaller area, isn't it? So species like the Powie, which uh, range over a wide area, but are nowhere common, 
because they need a large area to maintain their energy needs, are vulnerable to extin uh, extinction themselves. Okay, so the Poway, low density but wider area, so it is rare still, there are still a few individuals, not that many, it's estimated maybe about 200 individuals left in Trinidad, although we are not too sure. So it is vulnerable to extinction. Okay, because it has to range over a wide area too, um, that makes it vulnerable to over harvesting. And that's probably one of the reasons why this Poway is rare in the first place. It has been over exploited by humans because it's a nice chicken sized bird, make a nice meal in the pot, so it tends to be over hunted. Okay? couple more Trinidad examples and a Hawaiian example. Um, this is some work uh, which I did on the conservation of endemic plant species in Trinidad and Tobago. So endemic species, as you know, are species which uh, only occur in a particular area. In, in this case, if they're endemic to Trinidad, then they only occur in Trinidad. So the people who um, should make an assessment of whether this species is at risk of um, extinction or not, based on the different patterns of species vulnerability, uh, will be people from Trinidad. So we did an assessment of the plants, the endemic plants of Trinidad, to see how each of them are, how vulnerable each of them are to extinction. This species of um, shrub, Justica flaviflora, is um, a shrub which is only been collected from uh, the Aripo, the heights of Aripo, um, above uh, 900 meters above sea level. Okay, and the cross there represents the uh, collection locality of this species. Only been collected there nowhere else in Trinidad and nowhere else in the world because it is an endemic. Okay, so uh, if you think that the Broadway's orchid uh, in the Repo Savannas has put all its eggs into one basket, look at this species. It only occurs in a few square kilometers in the tops of the northern range there. Okay, so it's a, ver it's a very rare species it's very restricted, so if a hurricane came through Trinidad and wiped out all the ecosystems along the top of the northern range, what would happen to this endemic species? It probably would be wiped out. So this species is classed as critically endangered. Oh, and another reason why it's critically endangered is because uh, Cerro del Aripo, the heights of Aripo, are not in any sort of protected area. So they can legally be cleared tomorrow for a hotel development if uh, desired. Um, un unfortunately, Justica flaviflora is one of those, uh, one of about 10 or 12 or even more, 10 or 15 high altitude endemic species found in Trinidad. So there are maybe 15 or so species which have the same pattern of distribution as Justica flaviflora and they are only found in the high altitude at parts of Trinidad and I've got those uh, shaded in on this diagram so all the elfin woodland lower mon uh, sorry lower montane and montane and montane forest are shaded in on this map so these are the areas which potentially Justica flaviflora could occur. It hasn't been collected in these areas, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's not there because the status of a lot of these endemic plants simply hasn't been worked out yet. So Justica flaviflora, an endemic plant, um, very restricted, very rare, so that makes it very vulnerable to extinction. Okay. The ocelot. The ocelot is another species found in Trinidad. It's also very rare. It 
it's surprising it seems to be found over quite a few ecosystems in Trinidad we are not too clear on what the status of its population is but wherever it occurs it's only going to occur at a fairly low density we know that from um, studies done elsewhere in the world on the ocelot so it's only going to occur at low densities that makes it vulnerable to habitat fragmentation and habitat clearing it looks like well we're not too sure but it may be the ocelot is able to cope and adapt to secondary ecosystems as long as some of its prey items are able to adapt to these secondary ecosystems and one of its main prey items is of course the agouti okay so if agouti can adapt to secondary ecosystems which we know that it can then the ocelot should be able to adapt to secondary ecosystems as well okay and in fact we're finding that there is populations of ocelot which use the Aripo Sabana scientific reserve which is a very um, disturbed and in quite, pro in quite close proximity to human activity and yet there are ocelots there which we would not have predicted uh, before we started our biodiversity survey there so it may be that ocelots are actually able to cope with the environmental changes brought about by people and they may be in a better state. Um, there is a, a study which is being proposed to be funded by Earthwatch um, by your very own uh, Dr. Luke Rostan uh, in the department and collaborators overseas uh, to look at the um, status of the ocelot and other mammals in Trinidad using um, uh, more recent um, techniques such as camera traps and so on. Um, why exactly I have Hawaii in there is probably to do with the fact that uh, these island species are effectively rare um, by definition. Many of the species on islands have evolved in isolation so they only occur on that island. Uh, by definition an island is very small and surrounded by water and so these species will only ever have a very small uh, area in which to um, live out their lives. So the populations will necessarily of these island species be small. Okay, That makes island species um, very vulnerable to extinction through stochastic events and so on. Okay, So island species are particularly uh, vulnerable uh, or to extinction because of the nature of the size of their populations. Okay, Right, let's move on now. We talked about rarity and vulnerability to species extinction. Let's talk about um, long-lived species now. Long-lived species are also vulnerable to extinction. Now, long-lived species, um, also known as K-selected species, are uh, is a term really for a collection of life history traits or lifestyle traits. Long-lived species tend to be uh, evolved to be competitively superior in a very specific stable habitat. Quite often that means that they tend to be quite large, okay, as we have two examples here. And being large and being competitively superior in a specific stable habitat, they tend to have low um, intrinsic rates of population growth. In other words, they have long gestation periods like the elephant, um, long periods of maternal care like the elephant where the mother elephant will teach the offspring uh, how to survive in the environment and that takes a long time. So any loss of individuals from the population is not um, uh, the population is not well adapted to. Okay, Because they're adapted to be competitively superior 
in that environment, every loss of an individual is felt very keenly by this population. Okay? And it takes a long time for that individual to be replaced. So that makes these species very vulnerable to changes in um, the environment and changes in um, changes in uh, pressures, predation, um, food supply and so on. Any change will mean that their competitive edge may be lost. Uh, any harvesting may mean that uh, individuals uh, are lost at a rate which cannot be replaced by reproduction. Elephants are one example of this. The plant, the plant world also has their examples as well. This is a bristlecone pine. And bristlecone pine are some of the oldest living organisms or um, living things in the world. I think this particular bristlecone pine, the um, tree rings have been counted and it's been shown that um, the bristlecone pine is something like uh, four or five thousand years old. So it was young uh, when uh, Christ was walking around the Holy Land in the biblical times. Well, sorry, it was old even then. It was three thousand years old. So these bristlecone pines are very much uh, geared towards survival in a very stable habitat. They don't grow very fast. So this, this pine is something like um, five or six thousand years old and yet a human could come up to about half the height of this pine. Okay, So it's taken that long for the thing to grow. So it grows very slowly, reproduces very slowly and at very specific times when the environment is right. So you chop one of these down then it's going to take millennia to be replaced. So these types of long-lived or K-selected species are particularly vulnerable to extinction. In Trinidad, do we have any examples? Um, maybe the ocelot, that's also a K-selected species. Any other species? Not really, um, because Trinidad ecosystems have been under pressure, a lot of the large species have been lost already, like the tapirs and the jaguars, those um, large long-lived K-selected species are already extinct in Trinidad. Alright, let's move on now and talk about another trait which predisposes a species to extinction and that's a keystone, de uh, keystone species dependent species. So a species which is dependent on another species, on a keystone species, tend to be vulnerable to extinction as well. So if uh, the species that um, a particular species relies on goes extinct, then that species will also go extinct. Okay, Because tropical forests have so many species and they all interact biotically uh, with pollination, predation, uh, seed dispersal and so on. If one species is lost in a tropical forest then other species are going to be affected and they may cause what is known as an extinction cascade. So as one species is lost maybe four or five other species will be lost Okay, because they, dispense, they depend on it and it is a keystone species for these other species. So keystone species dependent species are also vulnerable to extinction. Right, um, let's move on and let's finish up. How do we assess the risk of uh, extinction? Um, well, we pull all these different criteria together like uh, habitat size, whether it's a K-selected long-lived species, whether it's dependent on a keystone species. We pull these things together 
into a list and we can assess the risk of extinction for these different species. And this uh, process has been standard by, standardized by the IUCN, um, or the International Uni uh, Union of Conservation of Nature, um, into the IUCN Red List, which is the standard list of threatened species around the world. So a standard criteria is put together to classify different species around the world into categories, the IUCN Red List categories. And those categories range from extinct in the wild, uh, sorry, completely extinct both in the wild and in, uh, in captivity, extinct in the wild, uh, critically endangered, uh, endangered, threatened, and of least concern. So, least concern, the species isn't, isn't going to go extinct, it's not under pressure. Critical means that the species is likely to go extinct unless something is done to preserve it. Okay? And extinct obviously means extinct. So, an example of this would be the endemic plants of Trinidad, this research project that I was involved with. Um, and you can see that we went through all the endemic plants and we assessed them according to the IUCN criteria, which uh, included the home range size of the species, uh, whether the population has been decreasing in historical times, whether the habitat of the species is under pressure and so on. Uh, so we had a range of uh, categorizations. Uh, Acaphila griesbachiana uh, in the Euphorb Euphorbiaceae is a shrub uh, which occurs in the Central Range Reserve, the main ridge, main ridge in Tobago, in the Northern Range, in the VMFR. So it ranges from lowland habitats to montane habitats. Uh, so it occurs fairly widely in Trinidad. It's endemic, so it only occurs in Trinidad, but it is categorized as a species of least concern. So it's widespread enough that it's not going to be wiped out tomorrow. The next step up is uh, near threatened, okay? And that's Aegyphila obovata. It's only found in the Main Ridge Forest Reserve. You know, that's a protected area, but it's found outside that protected area. Um, it um, it uh, occurs fairly widely. I think it's lowland as well as highland it's been collected from. So it's um, near threatened, but it's not uh, too bad at the moment. It only occurs in one protected area though, so that hence it's near threatened category. Let's go down to uh, Berzleria uh, Setsi uh, in the Gesneri AC. That's classified as vulnerable. Okay, it's found in the Main Ridge Forest Reserve in Tobago, but it probably found over a range of habitats. It may be collected quite a lot in the Main Ridge, and the Main Ridge Forest Reserve in Tobago is thought to be relatively secure. <coughs> it's not being threatened by squatting and so on, so it's not likely that it's going to uh, be lost from that area anytime soon. So it's classified as vulnerable. It's only found in the Main Ridge Forest Reserve, but it is likely to be fairly secure. But things may change. The next uh, level of categorization is endangered. So that's EN here. And that uh, is Begonia marianensis. Uh, this um, plant in the Begoniaceae only grows on the banks of the northward flowing rivers of the northern range. Okay, um, It's been found on about three rivers now, um, fairly healthy populations in habitat which is uh, does not seem to be threatened in any way just at the moment uh, by squatting and so on but it doesn't occur in any protected areas. 
and that riparian um, riverbank habitat is very restricted. So if the style comes in for squatting on river banks, it will be wiped out. Or if squatting starts to spread up these northern range rivers, it will be wiped out. Okay? So this area does need to be incorporated in a protected area. Um, so that is the reason why it has a, a classification, a risk extinction risk classification of endangered. Okay, so EN is endangered and these uh, codes uh, give a reason why it's endangered. B2, A, B3, so I think that's a uh, restricted area and potentially vulnerable to habitat clearance. The highest level of uh, risk is um, critical, so CR. So it's thought that unless something is done, this species is likely to go extinct. And this is Clusia in, intertexta, along with its colleagues Clusia repoensis and Clusia tucuchensis. Um, this species is um, restricted to the tops of the north mountains of the northern range, in much in the same way as that Justica flaviflora is. Um, the repoensis and the tucuchensis um, occur in protected areas. Okay, and that means that their uh, status has been classed as endangered, but the Clusia intertexta has not been found in any protected areas, so it's classified as being critically endangered. It's only found on the Cer Cerro del Aripo massif, so if that is lost, then this species will be lost. Uh, okay, so. These guys uh, occur on several peaks, more than one peak, but this species only occurs on one peak, so it is critically endangered, much like I think the Justica flaviflora is itself. Okay, so there's your um, lecture on extinction, uh, vulnerability to extinction, and assessing the risk of extinction. Um, I hope it's been informative. Please read the textbook. I can only really give you an overview in a lecture, so I'm really relying on you to read your textbook to really get the full details on these different topics. Okay, thank you very much for your attention.